Hey, no, what is the question? It says find the uh, feasible set, right? So, if you have three functions now in general you have uh, f of x, h of x. What does the feasible set depend on? If there is no h of s or g of s, what is the feasible set? Hey, hold on, no, no. What is the definition of the feasible set? Yeah, possible values of x that you can search over, right? If there was no h of x in x and g of x, what is the feasible set? No. Feasible set, no. See, this is really fundamental, no? What is the feasible set? No, no. Feasible set and feasible directions are different, no? What is the feasible set? Sorry? Forget about that. What is the feasible set? When, I, when somebody says feasible set for an optimization problem like, like this, what do you understand by it? Said what? Yes? No, no. What do you mean by the set will give you the min of f of x? Is the question clear? I am simply asking, what do you understand by the feasible set? Yes, that's all. Set of all values of x that satisfy the constraint, that's all. So, it is a set of all x such that this is equal to 0. This is the feasible set. If there was no h of x or g of x, then all x is, the, all x is feasible. No? So, if there was no h of x or g of x, then the feasible set is simply Rn. You are free to choose anything from Rn to minimize this. If there are a set of constraints, then you can only choose x from this set to minimize the effects. You cannot choose anything outside. As, well, let's say you choose a set uh, uh, x value that does not belong to this. And maybe that value of f of x is lower than any of these possible values. But that is not a solution because this does not satisfy the constraint. Okay. Let's say you are designing uh, some mechanical structure <coughs> and you have to optimize this length L <coughs> right and let's say you decide to search over all possible real numbers and then the optimal uh, value you get is minus 10 centimeters that makes no sense you cannot have something that has negative length right so if you Try and solve a constraint optimization. Well, if you try and solve a problem without an appropriate, con without if you do an unconstrained optimization problem, you are saying I will allow any value for my x. But for problems like this, where you are talking about uh, your x being, well, let me just call this x, x being the length of some structure in your uh, the mechanical design that you are making, x has to be positive. Well, let's say we cannot even have zero uh, length. So here, if you say my my, uh, if you if you now report a value of minus ten, which is outside your constraint. You see, for example, let's say you 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 have a mechanical structure you're designing, and the function you're trying to minimize is f of x. X is some the length of something. And you impose the constraint x has to be greater. So the only possible solution to this minimization problem is all or any value of x that is positive. Right? Let's say we know the value of f of x for all possible values of 
positive x, right? You have a bunch of values, f of, uh, you have a bunch of values. Let's say we know that f of minus 10, even though minus 10 makes no sense because x is the length of something, let's say f of minus 10 is lower than any possible value of f of x when x is greater than 0. This can, this might have a lower value, but this is of no interest to us because this makes no sense. Because it does not satisfy the constraint x greater than 0. See what I mean? See for example, if you have this, let's say x belongs to R2. Where is the, what is the solution to this problem? When is this minimum? Well, these are vectors. This is easy, no? What is, where does the minimum occur? Yes. This is where the minimum occurs for this. This is your f of x. But if I impose the constraint like this, now where does the minimum occur? Yes. No, no, not 1. 1, 1. Right? But this is f of 1, 1. This is the lowest possible value you can get for this function within these constraints. Because we know f of 0, 0 is smaller than f of 1, 1. But that does not matter. All we are allowed to search over are the set of values of x that satisfy this constraint. Okay. Same here. A feasible set is simply a set over which you are allowed to search. You are not allowed to search outside this. That is a feasible set. If it is an unconstrained optimization problem, then all the possible values of x, all of Rn is your feasible set, else whatever satisfies these constraints. Okay, okay. Now what is the question? Yeah. So x and zero are Yes. That is all. So you simply have to find the set of values of x that satisfy that those constraints, that is it. See, let us do the first one. What is, just read out the first one. So, the first, minus, this is the only constraint we have. This is an R2, so I can plot it. Well, this will probably be some line like this. This is your h of x equals 0. So, the set of all values of x that satisfy this line is your, this is your feasible set f. That means, you cannot search anywhere in R2 now. If your, if the goal is to now minimize some f of x, you can only move along this line and then find out which point along this line f of s has the lowest value. And similarly for the other problem. The question is, what is the minimum possible value for Ax minus b for this function? This is some function f of x. A and b are fixed. 
Okay, you tell me how do you approach this problem? Okay, you get the gradient. What is this though? What will you get if we expand this? What do you get if you expand this? Yeah? Sorry? Uh, yes, okay. But hold on, there is. You are given this though. What can you say about the size of A, shape of A, if the rank is M? Well, it can be square also. It can be square or fat. Right? Okay. Also, you can do the least squares. Can you really solve it with least squares? Why not? You are saying no. Let us say, let us understand why. Why no? What is the condition? The, in, for that particular problem, what is the condition on A? What is it? What matrix? It is a tall matrix. Is this a tall matrix? So, you, I, that might, that will not apply here. Well, it will apply if this is square. If A was, if M is equal to N, then that will apply. And in fact, your A pseudo inverse will simply be what? When A is square in full rank, what will be the pseudo inverse? Sorry? Ah, it will be A in, it will just be A in, that is it. Okay. Then the solution is simply x equals A in must be. But that is not what, that is not what the question is. The question is not about what is the value of x for which this function is minimum. The question is what is the lowest possible value for this function. Let us take the square case, right. In the square case, what is the lowest possible value for this function. You are allowed to choose any x you want. x of course belongs to Rn. If you are allowed to choose any possible x for a given A is fixed for any B, what is the lowest possible value you can get for this function? Why is it 0? So, sorry, hey, hold, on, hold, hold on, this, are you saying this is square or the matrix A is square? Oh, you are saying this is square. Okay, fine. It can be 0. But how do you know for sure that is 0? It is 0. It can be, all it says is that it cannot be negative, right? It can be 4, for all we know. Sorry? Need not be, right? For example, um, but yeah, okay. But tell me why. That is fine. The minimum possible value is 0. But you have to convince me that it is actually 0 or if it is something else. It is 0, but you need to explain why. Sorry? Okay. Um, so, you are saying you take the column space of A and you are saying B is outside. And then if you project it here, this will be some B cap that is equal to AX, this is B. But that is not 0 though, this is according to your argument, this is some, this has some finite length, no? Where is this length? The clue is really this. It is not tall. What does it mean when it is not tall? What can you say about the column space of A? What can you say about the column space of A? Where is the column space of A? Which space? Column space. 
is it an rm or not rn rm right okay what can you say so if a rank of a is m what can you say about the column space of a it's rm column space of a is simply rm you can reach any vector in rm now can you tell me what is the lowest possible value for this it's zero why is it zero where is b from where where should b from uh, hey no no hold on ax is always from the column space of a no matter what x you choose ax will always be in the column space of a okay see ax is to belong in rm that means you are talking about the subtraction of two vectors this b also has to be from rm if the column space of a is rm that means no matter what b you choose here you can always find the next such that ax equals b that means you can always solve this I mean, ax minus b equal to 0 can always be solved that means the lowest possible value for this if a is a is rank is m is 0 no okay <clears throat> Yes, it's a scalar, no? Okay. No. If you multiply this out, what will you get? You can verify this. This is what you'll get, and it'll be minus two times. this is what you will get okay this is a scalar this is a vector in rn well it will be rm this is a vector from rm so this is inner product between two vectors this is a scalar this is from rm this is from rm inner product so it will be a scalar are you asking what is are you asking what is this are you asking about the induced norm yes uh -huh. okay see okay we'll get to that uh, we'll finish this first i'll leave this for now here let's say a was this Let's say I choose some b one, b two, okay, and I take the norm of this second norm. This is a vector. I'm taking the two norm of the vector. The rank of this is two. Okay, that means uh, the col the column space is in R R two. The rank the the dimension of the column space is two. That means it spans R two. That means if you use this matrix, you can choose any x you want, and then you can generate all possible vectors in R two. So if I if you get any vector like this, you you can always choose an x that will give me this vector. That means a x equals b can be perfectly solved. No, still not clear. Okay, let's say this was just rank two. Here the question is, what is the minimum possible value of this function, right? When it says what is the minimum possible value, of course you are saying you can choose any x you want. Okay. Let's say a was square and rank m, that means a is invertible, right? If I choose my x to be a inverse b, then this would become a times. These two become i. B minus b is zero, so the lowest possible value is zero. When a is square and full rank, okay. When a is tall, or sorry, a is fat. 
n this is n this is n n rank m if the rank is n the column space of this matrix is rm okay let's go back to matrix matrix inversion if you have a fat matrix that is full rank that means we can find a right inverse such that this is i right this is m cross n this is m cross n right and there are infinitely many right inverses okay now if i choose any of those right inverses right and i multiply it by b and i say that is equal to x okay then ax will be a times b but ab is i that means i can choose an infinite number of x's and the way you choose that you, ch you choose any of the right inverses of a and you multiply the post multiply the right inverse by this vector b then that's a valid solution for x equals b okay the same argument applies there right let's say a is fat right full rank because rank is m i simply choose a right inverse for a multiply it by b and i call this x and if i do x minus b this is i that means b minus b this is zero is that clear i hope that's clear okay what about this what happens here is it still zero now the same question except i change i switched it like this now it's what yes okay so now now the, so this whole argument that i made does it still apply here to say that the lowest possible value for f of x is always zero why will it always be greater than zero always always meaning no matter what is the value of m and n okay it'll be what if it's square let's say rank is n but it's square then what it'll be zero because a square invertible that means no matter what b we choose we can always make a x equals b so the lowest value will be zero if it's square if it's not square if it's tall okay what will that value be yes yeah what will it be yes right if you choose x to be as b then the lowest possible value is simply a pseudo inverse b minus b this is here this is the orthogonal projection of b onto the column space of a minus b that's the here this is your a a cap b this is your b this length is this so the minimum if a is tall and full rank the minimum possible value for this will be this okay all right sorry you, uh, what was the question so you had a question about this and then you started asking the norm of a matrix what norms did we look at vectors if you're talking about n vectors from rn yeah we yeah okay zeroth norm what is the did we look at the zeroth norm 
Sorry? Ah, yes, yeah, yeah, okay. There is a zeroth norm, that's why I was surprised if I talked about the zeroth norm, okay. We talked about the P norms, no? What is the definition of the P norm? Okay. Fine. This is fine, right? Okay. What if we talk about... Uh, well, matrices are also vectors. The set of matrices form a vector space. So, we can talk about the size of the matrix in some way. And we looked at one type of norm. What is it? Which looked very similar to the two norm in the in the RN case. Yes. What is the Frobenius norm? What is the definition? A. That's it. This is see, this is equivalent to you taking this matrix. Transforming it into a into a vector like this, and simply taking the two norm. That's the Frobenius norm. That's another way to think about the Frobenius norm. No? Okay. All right. Okay. The Frobenius, what is the Frobenius norm for this? One plus four plus sixteen plus one. Right. That's twenty-two. Another way to think about this is you take this and then you take the columns and then stack them one after the other. I do 1, 4, 2, 1. The 2 norm of this is 20. Okay. Then you could have stacked it some other way. You could have stacked it 1, 2, 4, 1. Doesn't matter. The norm is still the same If you even if you rearrange the number. Okay. So, this is one way to look at <coughs> the size of the matrix. In fact, you can define it like this as well. You can, well, I don't think it, it's a standard notation. You could have said, I'm going to call it uh, my norm. Okay? I could have said, this is my peak norm. You can define it like this. This, this would satisfy all the properties that a norm must satisfy. But people have found that the Frobenius norm is quite useful in applications and the other norms that we looked at, that are made, the induced norms are useful. So, that is why maybe nobody talks about this. But this is a valid norm. If there was an application where you wanted to define a norm like this, you are, you are valid uh, if you do this. It is valid. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry? It is same in the sense that if you think of this matrix as a vector like this or like this, then both of them are the same. See, essentially this is just, ah, yeah, then I'll, I'll come to that, yes. In terms, see, this is not an induced norm. Induced norm is a slightly different idea, okay. Here, uh, in the Frobenius norm and in this uh, custom defined norm, we are simply treating the matrix as a bunch of numbers. We can simply think, of, since there are only four real numbers, we can very well say this is actually an element from R4. Okay? You can think of it as an element from R4. In R4, you define the two norm as something like this. Square of individual elements and then you add them together. Okay? Now, the Frobenius norm is, no, sorry, the induced norm is slightly different. The Frobenius norm treats the matrix as simply a bunch of numbers. But we know matrices have, have another interpretation, right? They represent linear transformations from, well, this is, let's say this is m cross n, okay? They represent linear transformations. So, another useful idea that people have, uh, uh, or another idea that people have found useful is to talk about the norm of a matrix as the gain 
for example, if you think of this mapping as simply an element from R n going in and then an element y coming out from R m, the induced norm essentially captures the idea of how much does this matrix magnify a vector, it changes its length, okay? that is your induced norm, the induced norm essentially tells you what is the gain of, if a vector of some length goes in, how long can I expect my output vector to be, that is the idea. And the induced norm, the induced norm use the, uses the peak norm of the vector. Okay. Because I said here, we are talking about if a vector of specific length goes in, what is the length of my vector that comes out? But when I say length of a vector, right, there are infinitely many ways of defining the length of the vector. We have the first norm, second norm, third norm, so on and so forth. Similarly, there are infinitely many ways of defining the length of the vector here. Okay. Let us say we choose a particular norm, the pth norm. So, we are going to use the pth norm to talk about length of vectors here. We are going to talk about the pth norm for the length of vectors here. If you are talking about the pth norm for both the input and output, to capture this idea of the gain of this operation, then that is your pth induced norm. Okay, and the way it's defined is like this: uh, the whenever you see something like this, that's the peak induced norm for a matrix. This is simply uh, a x. The ma here, well, even before I get to this, let me just make this a little bit more clear. This is the length of the input vector, okay. The length of the input vector is simply P. The length of the output vector is P. If I am talking about the gain here, then it is output divided by input, okay, then it is like this. But there is a problem defining it like this, or well, it, it's a problem in the sense maybe if I choose a specific vector, I'll get some value for for this ratio. If I choose a different vector, I might get a completely different value. Okay. Let's say, okay, let's say I choose let's say A is my matrix. I choose x to be e1. If I choose x to be e1, what is the length of well, let's see. What is the length of the? Let's let's say we are talking about the two norm here. What is the length of the, of E one? E one is simply it's one, right? What is the length of A x? Well, this is E one, so A E one. What is A E one? A times E one. What is it? What vector do you get if you multiply these? Yeah, you get the first column. What is the length of the first column? 1. Fine. So, the ratio is 1. What if I choose this as E2? Well, length is 4. Uh, so, length is 1. I have two gains now. Which one do I define as, my, as the gain of my matrix? That is a problem. So, people say, okay, the gain can be different for different vectors. So, they say, okay, we will choose the maximum possible gain and the maximum over what? What are you, okay, this is an optimization problem. And what are you searching over? Sorry? No, no, you are, you are maximizing here. So, you want to find the maximum value of this by choosing, you are free to choose any x you want. So, x is simply here. Okay.
Yeah. Okay. Now, the two norm that you asked about. Okay. The two is not the same as the the two norm for for R n. When you say the two, the second induced norm of A, you are simply saying I am trying to find the maximum possible gain for my matrix A. And for computing that gain, I need to define the notion of length for my output vectors and my input vectors. And I'm going to be using the second norm for defining lengths. That's it. So the P here simply means what norm are you using for quantifying the length of stuff that goes in and length of stuff that comes out. Is that clear? So it just so turns out that the second norm of this is simply or sigma one. I think it's sigma one. That's the first singular value. Which is essentially the largest. So it's it's this. <coughs> okay. All right. Square of second of what? Okay. Here, if you treat your matrix as a vector, then yes. If you this is a, if you convert it a to some vector like this, then it's the square of the second norm of that vector. Yes. Okay, where is y from? Y is from the row space of A. Is it? Where is x from? Okay. See here. Okay. If A is <coughs> if A is fat. Okay. What can you say about Then m is less than m. Okay. For simplicity, let's say rank is m. It's full rank. What is the dimension of the row space? No dimension of the row space. So the input space is R n, output space is R m. If if the rank is What is the dimension of the row space? M, right? Because the dimension of the column space and the row space are the same. <coughs> column space of A is all of R M, but the row space is is this. Okay. This is only n dimension. What is it? That means there is an uh, yes, there is a null space which is not just a zero vector. What is the dimension of the null space? It will be n minus m. Okay, all right. Now, let's say, well, this is your, this is your R M. If I choose some vector b from here, okay, this vector b, for this vector b, there is always an element here, y, such that if I take that y. And I multiply it by a, I will get b. And in fact, there is only one element from the row space, such that if I take that element and I multiply it by a, I will get b. There is no other element in the row space which I multiply by a, which will give me b. So the mapping from the row space to the column space is unique. Okay, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. But if I now let's say I choose 
सम वेक्टर z from the null space okay. what will happen if i multiply this vector by a if i choose from the null space zero okay so if i take i get zero okay this also means that if i take y and i add any element from the null space it will still give me b that means the set of all possible solutions that will give me b ax equals b is a unique element from the row space and you simply add this whole n minus m dimensional subspace to that y and you will still get still get b that means every b here has a m n di n minus m dimensional set uh, space not subspace space uh, that will give me b Okay. it cannot be a subspace because for something to be a sub subspace the zero element has to be there if you take y and you add all possible elements from the null space there is zero there but if you add y to that that zero disappears it's not so it, it's not actually a subspace anymore okay. if it's not clear it's all this Okay, this is an R two. The set of possible solutions is an R two. X is X is from R two. Where is the row space? What is the definition of the row space? What is the definition of the row space? Set of all possible A transpose Y, right? It's or Simply the linear combination of the rows of the matrix A. That means if well, it's represented as a row, but it corresponds to this vector, right? What is the linear combination of this vector? All possible linear combinations of this vector one one alpha alpha. That's okay. that's your row space for this problem. For this A, this is your row space. what about the null space so the row space of a is simply how will you find the null space of this matrix well you equate a equals equal to 0 and then find out what possible x is solved for x equals 0 Yes. Okay. So the null space of A will simply be okay. Where does what does that look like here? This one. Okay. You could have said this without having to solve this. Because the null space is the orthogonal complement of the row space, right? All right. Okay. Now this is okay. Now, what is the set of possible solutions for this problem? Forget about this. Let's let's just keep this here for now. Tell me what are all the possible solutions for this equation? What are all the possible solutions? You're talking about x one plus four. Yeah, tell me a general expression. There are infinite number of solutions, right? Can you tell me a general expression for the solution? Or okay, 
so if i have x1 this is okay right this will or if i replace this by this is the set of all possible x's that will solve solve this okay okay this is the set of all x's right where gamma is a real number what is the locus of all these points in r2 because x is from r2 right we are saying these are all the possible x is from r2 that will solve that equation where is that so if you plot this there what will you get well if it's confusing make this as x1 this is x1 now can you tell me where what will be the plot of what where will be the set of these points in that plot in this space r2 this is x1 x we'll choose different values for x1 you if you choose x1 we know the value of x2 when x1 is 0 this is at 4 when x when this is 0 well uh, when this is 0 it's 4 see here it looks like it's like this no? okay now is this a subspace of r2 oh no this line it's not it does not pass through the origin right this is not a subspace of r2 this is essentially your gamma 4 minus gamma or another way to write this is 0 4 plus what is this this is the this, this is the null space plus some fixed vector and this is okay so that's essentially what you've done here okay so the solution for something like this is uh, or we started from here the set of solutions here if you if a has a non zero null space does not form a subspace of r2 this is in fact called an affine affine space okay which is essentially a subspace plus a constant okay all right anything else gradient of x transpose x is it okay you tell me what will it be will be will it be 2x transpose or will it be 2x when will it be 2x transpose and when will it be 2x we we talked about this now because when you're talking about the gradient there is a rule now it depends on whether you take the gradient with respect to a column vector or a row vector so now you tell me when will it be x transpose and when will it be uh, when will it be right right if you take the gradient with respect to x transpose then this will be 2x but if you take that's all there is no difference it what determines what you get is essentially what is the what is the gradient taken with respect to if there are any other questions you, you guys can come and uh, talk to us before the mid mid set yes okay so 
is positive semi definite it's symmetric right the uh, the question was the if you let's say we form a set s x belonging to rn such that x transpose ax equals 0 Uh, this is positive semi definite. The question is Does this set form a subspace of Rn? How would we figure that out? Sorry? We, we also say uh, it's also given that this is if it's positive semi definite what can we say about the eigen values of a sorry greater than or equal to zero because it's positive semi definite right right we know that lambda i some of them are zero because it's positive semi definite that is the clue. Let's say this is n cross n, right? Let's say there are there is only one zero eigenvalue. Let's say the last eigenvalue is zero. Okay. Then can you say if this is true? When will this be equal to zero if the last eigenvalue of A is zero? When I say last eigenvalue, lambda n is zero. Everything else is positive. So, what values of x will give me a transpose x transpose a x will be zero? Yeah. What is x n? You're right. What is x n? Not x n. B n. If you take the the nth eigenvector, a times b n is lambda n times b n. Lambda n is zero. So, this is zero. So, this is out. But if I choose any scalar multiple of Vn, this is still out because A times ga, uh, alpha times V is still 0. Alpha times Vn is all possible linear combinations of Vn or the subspace spanned by Vn. So, X is simply the set of all elements from the subspace spanned by Vn. So, this is in fact a subspace. No? Is it clear? No. Okay. Let's say we take a 2 cross 2 example. Right? This is lambda 1, 0, 0. The eigen pairs are lambda one v one and zero. This is clear. This is your a. Okay. Now, if I choose any x, I get some y. I don't know what that y will be, but I. Because I know the eigenvalues, I know that if I choose B1, I know exactly what will be the output. Will be lambda. What if I choose V2 in this particular case? So I'll get 0 times V2. I know they'll get 0. So that means if I choose X to be some scalar multiple times V2, then That means the set of all alpha times b2 such that alpha belongs is a real number. This set, if I choose any vector from the set, x transpose ax will be 0. Now the question is, does this set form a subspace of Rn? 
Well, this subspace is essentially all the linear combinations of V2, some vector. That means it is a one dimensional subspace in Rn. Is that clear? Okay. This is if only the last one is 0. Let us say this was 3 cross 3. So let us say the last two were 0. Now, if I choose V2, if I choose x to be V2, I get 0. If I choose x to be V3, I still get 0. Okay. That means if I choose Ax, that is a linear combination of the last two eigenvectors, I will get 0. That means if I have a set that is like this, where alpha 1 and alpha 2 are real numbers, this, and if you choose any element from the set, that will still give me 0. Because this is a linear combination of a couple of vectors from Rn, this forms a subspace of Rn. Right? So, essentially the answer was, if you choose, well, uh, this set is essentially, uh, the set that satisfies this, is essentially a set formed by the linear combination of all the eigenvectors whose eigenvalues are 0. And because it is a linear combination of a set of vectors in Rn, it has to be a subspace of Rn. Anything else? Yeah, if there are any questions, please drop by. Uh, uh, you tell me, what will be the dimension? I mean, I've, I've gotten you this far. It's your turn to think about it now. Well, what is the dimension here? Maybe that is the clue. What is the dimension of that subspace now? No, no, dimension of this subspace S. Hey, hold on. Dimension is a single number. It's a, it's a non-negative uh, integer. Why is it 1? What is the dimension of, what is the dimen definition of the dimension of a subspace? No, dimension of a subspace. Subspace is essentially a set, right? Let's not go to matrices. If I give you a set of back, yeah. No, what is see? You have to go back. What is the definition of the dimension of a subspace? How do I know that this is? How do I know that R two has dimension two? How do I know that this actually has dimension one? Or a plane in R three is of dimension two. Hold on. Okay. And to represent every point on this line, you need two numbers. Right. But, right. So, what is the definition? Yes. Somebody said. Yes. Essentially, it is the number of basis vectors that, well, number of vectors in the basis set for that subspace. Okay. Here, you are right. You only need one vector to produce all elements here. That means the basis has one vector. That means the dimension is 1. To reach every element in R2, you need two vectors in your basis set. So, then my question is, what is the, what is the dimension here? Why is it 2? If it is 2, you have to explain why it is 2. Why is it that the basis rec... Sorry? Sure. Okay. Third point, two vectors, right? But how do I know they are linear? So, for, how do I know they form a basis for this? Yeah, how do I know they are linearly independent? Sorry? 
I'll let you think about this. Yeah, you you go back and then think about uh, or look at symmetric matrices. Uh, symmetric, not symmetric matrices. Diagonalizable matrices, and then you if. Yeah, essentially that. If you say it's diagonalizable, that means you can find enough eigen your geometric multiplicity equals your algebraic multiplicity. So that's okay. So in fact, the geomet algebraic multiplicity of your eigenvalue zero is two because A is symmetric. You can always diagonalize it. That means the geometric multiplicity is two, uh, and these two will in fact be a linearly independent set of vectors. And you are taking the linear combination of two linearly independent set of vectors. That means the dimension has to be two, because this set is spanned by set of two elements that are linearly independent. That means they form a basis for this subspace. Okay. 